Welcome back, and uh, it's time for Today in History. We're going back to the year 1967 to tell you about a guy. Actually, today is uh, referred to as James Bedford Day. And the reason is because of something called cryopreservation. For those people who are hearing about it for the first time, it simply is the process of saving human tissue and muscles and organs and, and cells um, under extremely low temperatures and, of course, uh, freezing them with solid carbon dioxide um, for many, many years, just in case they can, of course, be revived again. And so uh, it says in 1967, Dr. James Bedford was the first person to be chronically preserved with the intent, and this is the one that really, really cracks me up, with the intent of future resuscitation. Um, he was an American psychology professor at the University of California. In June 1965, E.V. Cooper's Life Extension Society offered the opportunity to preserve a person uh, free of charge. And of course, he was the very first person that uh, signed up for that. Um, he died from a, a kidney cancer. And a few hours after he was dead, his body was frozen um, um, of course, by injecting it with 15% of dimethyl uh, sulfoxide and 85% ring gas solution. Uh, since then, 1967, he has only been seen once in the last 50 years. In 1991, he was moved to a new storage tank at the Alcohol Life Extension Foundation. And there were reports that uh, some of his organs and some parts of his skin were rotten in and, you know, falling off. Um, so yes, this, this happened for the first time in 1967. And for me, you know, once again, the shocking part of this story is the part where they wrote, with the intent of future resuscitation. Would you How? <laughs> <laughs> I, guess, I guess we need to actually just accept the fact that there's a time to be born and there's a time to die. Maybe there's things that they know that we don't know. And, and you know, another thing that I'm worried about, because we've seen too many movies... We've seen The Mummy, we've seen World War Z, we've seen yes, a lot of these. But, but indeed, we, you, we, we can give kudos to the ancient Egyptians who, you know, mastered the art of mummification. And many, yes. many years after, you know, the bodies were dug up, you know, the tombs were basically raided or opened. You find out and that these still, bodies are still fresh. Still fresh. You know, so Af Africans, we, but, we but, have the answer to some of these things. Yeah, I mean, but the catch here is the Egyptian mummies never planned to be resuscitated. You know, it was just their own form of preserving the body um, um and that is centuries ago so i know. think motive then is important here. yes you know so if you're saving dr james bedford's organs and body parts with the hope of future resuscitation i don't know how you know you plan doing that i can imagine you know whichever you know religious religious affiliation you belong to i can imagine you know your how would you call it now for christians you will say god for the muslims will say allah yeah. i can imagine god or allah just looking at him like okay <laughs> let's see how you want to do this right now i said it's over one, you're saying <laughs> one more round let's one see pandemic at a time guys remember yeah. okay so let's not you know also make some mistakes that would eventually create a new pandemic across the world um and once again we've seen too many movies where these things don't work you know and eventually just lead to um the walking dead for exactly. example and the like so everywhere thank god we didn't get to that uh, let's be to that careful point. here guys all right let uh, let james bedford be buried he's gone but anyway, um, 1967, the 12th of January, was the first time that cryopreservation was done by um, or to an American psychology professor at the University of uh, um, California. And uh, since then, he, of course, is still being kept in a place called Alcohol Life Extension Foundation. And um, um, we don't know how the story would end, if eventually he would be thrown away or uh, they would hope to resuscitate him sometime in the future. Good luck. Mm. Um, now, that just reminds me, I don't know if you saw the story about insects that were frozen for many centuries and then they were heated and some began to walk. Just reminded me of what you said that, you know, this, this is 2021, one pandemic at a time. Yeah, one please. pandemic at a time. You guys need to We don't careful. want anything weird, you know, yeah. coming up and causing another virus. Exactly. You know, well, okay, <laughs> let's, uh, let's now turn to, uh, we've, we're done with the, the very light issue. This is a very serious issue. You know, uh, the government in 2015, January uh, 12th, raided and 
killed 143 Boko Haram fighters. This was in Cameroon. Uh, it, was a, it was a raid in uh, Kolo Fata. That's the name of the place. It was an unsuccessful assault on the Cameroon military. military. So the Boko Haram attempted to basically attack the base in Cameroon, uh, but uh, this attack was basically foiled. Uh, the Cameroonian army, you know, went in, repelled the attack, killed between 200 to 300 insurgents, seized large quantities of, of uh, you know, weapons and ammunition, but one Cameroonian officer was also killed. You know, Cameroonian soldiers had seized heavy, you know, military equipment from the Boko Haram uh, terrorists during a recent attack then in Baga. And something about Boko Haram is that... Uh, They've been designated by the U.S. as a terrorist organization. They've been fighting since yes. 2009 to basically establish Sharia law in all 36 states in the country. And uh, we know that this is predominantly divided into, you know, uh, the Muslim North and the Christian, uh, the, the Muslim North and the Christian South. So we, we just hope that uh, the government continues to battle this. And uh, if you look on the other hand, it seems like shade to be thrown on the Nigerian government. But I didn't see them raising any alarm, telling everybody, hey, Boko Haram is coming, or take cover. They yeah. went in there and did what needed to be done. But, you know, um, what, you know, I'm going to be asking, you know, when I see a story like this, you know, it first of all makes me remember that 150 people were, you know, killed in the RAN bomb in, in, in 2015. The Nigerian Air Force uh, took responsibility for that, said that, you know, it was a mistake. Um, but may those souls rest in peace. But... Um, what I'm thinking when I hear that 143 Boko Haram fighters were killed um, is it makes me ask or wonder how many are they? Um, how many are these people that you can kill 143 of them and, in they one still day and they are still in existence? They are still able to recruit, they're still able to arm themselves, they're still able to fund their operations, they're still able to run a successful terrorist organization years and years and years after. This is what, 2012, I believe? Yeah, this was in 2015. 2015. So five years later, there's still a formidable terrorist organization in Nigeria. So how many are they really? And, you know, where re you know, are they getting the ammunition from? The Cameroonian government doesn't have to deal with Boko Haram, maybe because... They've taken more decisive steps against insurgency in their, in, their, in their country. But Nigeria is still dealing with it. It is still a major challenge to us. Our borders are still, you know, on the question as being extremely porous. Um, I would always say that the weapons that Boko Haram use aren't manufactured here. In, I don't think they're manufactured here in Nigeria. I don't think they have a weapons factory, you know, where they make, you know, bombs and, and, and um, you know, grenades and guns and, and, the, and the likes. Um, and so it, there is definitely some internal, um, you know, assistance that they're getting in definitely. bringing in these weapons into the country. There's, and, been, there's been so much news about Boko Haram sponsors. About six people were arrested in yes. the UAE. Uh, this was in the year 2020, just last year, November, arrested for being sponsors of Boko Haram terrorism. You know, this issue, basically, it's, it's, it's so saddening because it's something we keep seeing every day. And it reminds me of a conversation yesterday on The Breakfast about, about the Boko Haram terrorism being an ideological war, talking about you saying you're killing over 100 people and you're still seeing more people, you know, that Boko Haram is still a formidable force, so to speak. And in the North, you hear cases of kidnapping, kidnapping children, kidnapping young boys, and they basically indoctrinate them into the, uh, the way they think. Yeah. And I don't know how basically the, the, the conversion is done. And when these people are eventually, you, you know, released, you find out that Boko Haram terrorists were captured and all that. I wonder just how much rehabilitation was done because these people would need to go through a lot of psychological and emotional reevaluation for them to get out of, you know, that thinking that, you know, everybody else should be killed. You know, this way of religion or this way of life is right and is the way to go. Uh, these are, you know, and I think we're out of time, but th these are the effects of decades and decades of a low level of education in certain parts of Nigeria, decades and decades of thousands of school, uh, of, of children out of school, decades and decades of thousands of, you know, what they call our marjories. Um, that's, you know, th that's what it eventually turns into. Mm -hmm. So when you have years and years and years and you don't have children going to school to learn, when you have years and years of, of, um, of um, that level of almost zero education for these kids. It, it leaves um, a space for them to instead be recruited into these type of organizations. Um, and 
no matter, you know, you know, and it's one thing that I always point out, no matter how much we want to blame this side, I would always point out the blame that the Nigerian government should take, you know, with yes. regards to this thing. And it's not just this current administration, previous administrations that have failed to ensure um, that there is better education for the yeah. thousands of kids in, in northern Nigeria. Yes, and uh, our guest is standing by for the next segment, so we'll call it a wrap here on Today in History. Do stay with us, and we'll be back to discuss a key issue in security.